the, the speaker for this uh, session, Dr. Nobuhiro Nakamoto. Uh, he is from the uh, Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology in the Department of Internal Medicine, Keio University School of Medicine. And um, he is presenting a seminal work on uh, gut pathobionts underlying the intestinal barrier dysfunction and the liver TH17 immune response in in patients with uh, primary sclerosis and cholangitis. Thank you for your in uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Nobuhiro Nakamoto. Uh, I'm honored to be here to present our work in our Pastor Single Topic Conference. I'd like to thank the organizer, especially Dr. Tanaka, for invitation, and also thank Miyari and Pharmaceutical for their support. So this is the agenda of my today's talk. Uh, in the first part, uh, I will review the recent topic about microbiota and liver disease. And in the second part, I'd like to present our recent work entitled Gut Pathobions and the Rye Intestinal Barrier Dysfunction and Liver TH17 Cell Immune Response in Primary Sclerosis Choranditis PTSD. So at the beginning, uh, I'd like to summarize the classification of bacteria, uh, the first, largest, and most inclusive group and of each organism classified is called a domain and then three subgroups, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryote. This first group defines whether an organism is prokaryote or eukaryote. Bacteria is further split into phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, which is the smallest group. This slide shows the representative classification in proteobacteria. So, Klebsia pneumonia, uh, I will focus on later, is classified in proteobacterial phylum, gamma proteobacteria class, enterobacterial order, and an enterobacterial family. So recently, uh, fecal microbiota transplantation has been attracting attention as a noble treatment option to improve dysbiosis. The first target disease was recurrent close radium deficiency infection, demonstrated in New England Journal of Medicine in 2013. In the study, the effect of duodenal infusion of donor feces in patients with recurrent CDI was examined. Of 16 patients in the infusion group, 13 achieved a resolution after the first infusion. The three remaining patients received a second infusion with feces from a different donor with resolution in two patients. The cure rate was significantly better than that of antibiotic treated group. They also found that the diversity of microbial composition is significantly lower in patients. And also they found that increased fecal bacterial diversity after FMT, similar to that in healthy donors, with an increase in bacteroidal species and cross radium clusters and a decrease in proteobacteria. Recent reports have shown that microbiota provides many beneficial functions to its host, including synthesizing nutrients, protecting against invasion by pathogens, and regulating immune response. Notbio system using germ-free animals has enabled us to identify the specific microbiota that directly induce T cell development, including Th1, Th2, Th17, and T leg cells, either individually or by the combination. For example, SFV induced SAA secretion from intestinal epithelial cells that stimulate DC and in turn lead to TS17 development. Furthermore, recent progress has further extended the concept to other immune cell subsets, including innate immune cells. Our group has reported that the specific species of Lactobacillus, Lactobacillus johnsoni, induce IL-22 producing IL-C3 in the intestine and plays a role in restoring the gut, gut barrier integrity. The gut microbiota plays a critical role in host physiology processes in the GI tract. In addition, 
Recent evidence indicates that the gut microbiota by interacting with immune cells also contribute to physiological regulation in extra-intestinal sites, including lung, skin, joint, and brain, and its disruption may lead to disease aggravation at individual sites. However, the precise mechanism by which the gut microbiome community regulates the pathophysiology of extra-intestinal sites remains unclear. Um, this is an earlier POC making paper demonstrates the role of gut microbiota in regulating metabolic disease. They transplanted fecal microbiota from adult female to impaired discordant for obesity into jump free mice fed raw fat diet. And they found that total body and fat mass as well as obesity associated metabolic phenotypes were transmissible. Co-housing mice harboring an obese twin microbiota with mice containing the lean co-twin microbiota prevented the development of obesity phenotypes, suggesting the lower of a specific gut microbiota in shaping body composition. So we would like to introduce another representative example in our group demonstrating the role of gut microbiota in extra-intestinal disease. Indeed, we have studied this project to clarify how biotin deficiency affects the severity of colitis. Since biotin is an essential nutrient for human health, for this purpose, mice were divided in three groups, such as normal diet, biotin deficient diet, two groups with polymixin B uh, for, this, for, in, for inducing this biosis, and also normal diet, biotin deficient diet with vancomycin treatment. Unexpectedly, we found that this biosis induced by antibiotics impaired gut metabolic function and led to the development of alopecia. While deprivation of dietary biotin, as shown here, did not affect skin physiology, its simultaneous treatment with vancomycin, as shown here, resulted in hair loss in SPF mice. Metagenomic analysis revealed that vancomycin treatment in mice-fed biotin-deficient diet induced the altered composition of microbiota, as shown above, with the dominant accumulation of lactobacillus murinus in the gut, which consumes the residual biotin and depletes available biotin in the gut. Consistently, monocolonization of lactobacillus mucinus to germ-free mice with biotin-deficient diet feeding induced alopecia, as shown here, indicated that lactobacillus mucinus plays a central role in the induction of hair loss via biotin-dependent manner. Of note, supplement, supplementation of biotin in vancomycin-treated mice with biotin-deficient diet feeding can reverse established our facial symptom in the SPF condition. We also confirmed that the composition of microbiota did not change following systemic biotin supplementation, suggesting that biotin supplementation bypass microbiome dysbiosis and rescue hair physiology. So in the steady state, biotin is supplied by dietary intake and also maintained by bacterial synthesis as shown here. However, long-time treatment with antibiotic vancomycin resulted in the accumulation of vancomycin-resistant lactobacillus murinus in the intestine. Because this bacterium lacks the ability to produce biotin, a predominance of lactobacillus murinus concomitant with a lack of dietary biotin led to the development of a skin disease resembling alopecia in mice. This study thus demonstrates that gut dysbiosis promote alopecia via biotin depletion in the gut and provides a basis for understanding the previously unknown link between gut microbiota and skin disease. Okay, so we need to go back to liver. Liver faces continuous exposure to many pathogens and a commensal bacteria, commensal microbial product through portal vein and various immune cell subsets, macrophage, dendritic cell, NK cell, T cell, and B cell, 
that carry out both innate and adaptive immunity eliminate them and maintain the homeostasis in balance. So I'd like to summarize the current knowledge, how gut microbiota contribute to the liver injury. In the steady state, bacteria cannot easily attach the intestinal epithelium by mucin layers, as well as and also antimicrobial peptides. In a specific condition of liver disease, such as alcoholic liver disease, NASH, and autoimmune liver diseases, altered composition of gut microbiota termed dysbiosis, leaky gut, and excessive immune activation against the translocated bacteria occurs and may give rise to the liver inflammation. However, the precise mechanism has not been clarified. To address the clinical question whether pathogenic bacteria can reach the extraintestinal site liver, in this study, E. coli was orally inoculated into germ-free mice in the study. So in the steady condition, live commensal bacteria invaded the mesenteric lymph nodes, as shown circle by a lymphatic trafficking of intestinal disease, carrying commensal sampled at the intestinal epithelial surface, while no bacteria could be detected in the liver, shown in rectangle. After treatment with DSS, that disrupts intestinal barrier. An intestinal dose of bacteria that would normally be found only in the mesenteric lymph nodes consistently leads the liver. So these results suggest that liver may act as a vascular firewall for the mesenteric circulation and a condition of weakened mucosal barrier dysfunction. So the role of gut microbiota in human health and disease has received considerable attention. Liver cirrhosis occurs as a consequence of a chronic liver disease. So in this 2014 Nature paper, the research characterized the gut microbiome in liver cirrhosis by comparing 98 patients and 83 healthy control individuals. They built a reference gene set for the cohort containing 2.7 million genes. Quantitative metagenomics revealed more than 70,000 genes that differ in abundance between the patient and healthy individual and can be grouped into 66 clusters. Most of the patient enriched species are of oral origin, as shown here, such as Bayron error, suggesting an invasion of the gut from the oral cavity in liver cirrhosis. So the presence of advanced fibrosis in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFRUD, is one of the most important predictors of liver mortality. There are limited data on the diagnostic accuracy of gut microbiota derived signature for predicting the presence of advanced fibrosis. In this, predictive, in this prospective study, the authors characterize the gut microbiome components using whole genome sequencing of DNA extracted from human stool samples. At the phylum level, the gut microbiomes in both groups were dominated by members of Firmicutes and Bacteroides, followed by Proteobacteria and Actinobacteria. Furthermore, both Firmicutes and Proteobacteria were differentially abundant across the two groups with pharmacutes higher in NAFRUD, while proteobacteria was higher in advanced fibrosis. At the species level, Eurobactam, Rectore, and Ruminococcus ovium were the most abundant organisms in NAFRUD, while Bacteroides, Brugates, and E. coli were the most abundant in advanced fibrosis. So another study published very recently uh, demonstrated substantial intestinal dysbiosis in patients with NASH-based HCC, which was characterized by an increase in bacteroides and luminococci compared with control with HCC, without HCC. The model highlighted an inverse correlation between the abundance of acamasia and fecal carb protecting. Notably, acamasia was the most represented bacterium in the control group. So in another word, 
Akamashia was reduced in HHG group. Carprotectin was directly associated with plasma level of CCR5 and IR6, as well as increased frequency of activated circulating monocytes. So regarding the question, uh, whether the role for gut microbiota on the calcium genesis in the liver, a previous study clearly suggested the association. In the study, the authors demonstrated that the intestinal microbiota and the activation of TORAC receptor 4 contribute to the development of liver cancer immune model. Of note, treatment of mice with antibiotics or TORAC receptor for deficient mice led to decreased liver tumor burden. A role for specific bacteria has also been observed in liver metastasis of colorectal cancer. In this study, there are also frequently detected Fusobacterium, both in primary human colorectal cancer and its liver metastasis by QPCR or culture of the sample that's shown black in this panel. Of note, antibiotic treatment by metronidazole targeting Fusobacterium successfully reduced the tumor volume in PDX model. Importantly, Fusobacterium was not detected in patients with primary HCC suggesting that intestinal bacteria contribute to tumor genesis in a disease-specific manner. Obesity has been recognized as a major risk factor for several cancers. So in this nature paper, they explored the possibility that intestinal bacteria have key roles in obesity-associated HCC development. So treatment with a very established oral antibiotic cocktail causes the MERC reduction of HCC development. 16S RNA gene sequencing analysis of the intestinal microbiota revealed that the percentage of gram-positive bacteria struct strains were dramatically increased with a high-fat diet. Moreover, a treatment with vancomycin that preferentially targets gram-positive bacteria alone was sufficient to block HCC development, as shown here. Interestingly, the level of deoxychoric acid, DCA, a secondary bile acid was sub substantially increased by high-fat diet feeding and was reduced by vancomycin treatment. Intriguingly, a significant enhancement of HCC development was observed when high-fat diet mice treated with antibiotics were fed DCA. These findings provide new insight into the development of obesity-associated cancer and open up new possibility for its control by manipulating gut microbiota. And in a recently published study, Ma and colleagues further explored the interplay of microbiota control, bile acid metabolism, and immune response in the context of liver tumors in mice. They report that gut microbiota delayed bile acid control NKT cell function in the liver, which then affects tumor growth. They again noted that a combination of antibiotics specifically reduce tumor growth, which is associated with hepatic accumulation of activated CXCR6 NKT cells. NKT cells indeed protected against liver carcinogenesis by interferon gamma secretion, as antibody-mediated depletion of NKT cell abolished protection against hepatic tumorigenesis induced by pro antibiotic treatment. Notably, liver endothelial cells, expression of CXCR6, which is a ligand of CXCR6, was increased by primary bile acid, such as canodeoxychoric acid, CDCA, whereas secondary bile acid derived from the microbiota decrease CXCR6 expression. These results suggest that manipulation of the bile acid composition may be a key concept for HCT therapy in the future. A major breakthrough uh, in cancer immunotherapy uh, was the discovery of immune checkpoint proteins, which function to effectively inhibit the immune system through various mechanisms. The first of such molecules show the first of such molecules shown to inhibit T cell proliferation was CTR4. With this, with this discovery, 
efforts turned to blocking the inhibitory pathway in an attempt to activate T cells directed at cancer cells. The first antibody directed against CTR4, Ipilimibab, was quickly approved by FDA for the treatment of metastatic melanoma in 2011. Following the success of Ipilimibab, as I mean, checkpoints were studied as possible targets for inhibition. One such interaction was that of the PD-1 receptor and its ligand pd one So just a break. Uh, I had an opportunity to concentrate on basic research as a postdoc in U University of Pennsylvania and BA Medical Center for three years, about 10 years ago. This is my boss, Dr. Kyomi Chan, who is an expert in HBV and HCB immunology field. UPenn is located in Philadelphia, a beautiful place to live and easy to, easy to drive to New York with my family. Yes, I had a great experience there. My theme there was to elucidate the mechanism of T cell dysfunction during HCB infection which lead to persistent infection. When HCV infect, antigen presenting cell presents their peptide with MHC, so that naive T cell can recognize by TCR. At the same time, positive signal through cosmetic ligand B7 and receptor CD28 are transmitted to gain effector function in terms of cytotoxicity as well as cytokine production. Once they can eradicate the virus effectively, they can clear them spontaneously. But when they cannot completely eradicate the virus, perhaps due to too high viral replication, PD-1 is induced on activated T cells and bind to its ligand, PD-1 and PD-2 on APCs. PD-1, PD-1 signaling inhibit CD28 mediated positive signal, which in turn reduce the effective function, and they are called exhausted T cells. This helps to limit excessive damage of liver tissues, such as seen in fulminant hepatitis, and also for HIV itself. That might be one mechanism why they can survive from host immune response. So we aim to examine whether these exhausted T cells could restore they are impaired effector function by blocking PD-1, pd one pathways. So this is the data from the identical liver transplant recipient. We could compare the ex vivo and in vivo in vitro effector function in PBR and in the liver. First, HCB specific CD8 T cells in periphery, which express lower PD-1, ex vivo and expanded well and gained effector functions such as perforin and CD107 and intergamma secretion, positive cell, after peptide stimulation. Furthermore, pd one blockade augmented the effector function from 0.7% to 9.4%. In contrast, although the number was high, highly PD-1 positive HCB specific CD8 T cell in the liver were dysfunctional. And surprisingly, they were refractory to pd one blockade as shown here, puffering low and steering tavagamma production low. Of note, this is not specific to liver since intrahepatic influenza specific CD8 T cells as shown here in the same patient expanded efficiently with high effector function. Afterwards, we notice that intrahepatic HCB specific T cells also express CTR4, another inhibitor molecule in addition to PD-1. Single pd one or CTR4 blockade had little effect on cytokine production. In contrast, combined blockade synergistically augmented the effect. These results suggested that intrahepatic HCB specific CD8 T cells were in a state of deep exhaustion, whose function could be restored by blockade of multiple inhibitory signal, which is exactly what, uh, sorry, uh, which is exactly what we are trying to do for cancer patients right now. 
Actually, at that time, I was sure that these findings can be translated to the clinic hep C, hep C treatment. However, it did not happen by the breakthrough development of direct acting antiviral to HIV. Okay, I still have a great experience and I'm sure our findings have contrib contributed to the recent success in the cancer field. Sorry to interrupt. Let me move back to the main talk. The checkpoint there for their trial is a prospective phase one to dose study of nivolumab, anti-PD1 monoclonal antibody that assess safe, safety and clinical benefit across multiple hepatocellular carcinoma etiology, including patients with HIV or HBB infection, maybe worse than non viral patients. Although the overall clinical response by the monotherapy is around 20%, for the improvement expected by dual therapy with anti-CTL4 or serotonin kinase inhibitor for patients with HCC in the near future. Recent report reveals that intestinal microbiota also determines efficacy of this checkpoint inhibition. Rudy and colleagues demonstrated that resistance to immune checkpoint inhibitors against epithelial tumor it influenced by an abnormal gut microbiome competition. As shown in the left, microbiome composition was different between patients who achieved a clinical response to the therapy shown in green and who did not shown in red. Human non responders to immune therapy therapies were characterized by low abundance of acamasia, as shown right. Notably, antibiotics inhibit efficacy of these drugs both preclinically and in patients with non-small cell lung cancer and renal cell lung carcinoma. Additionally, fecal microbiota transplantation from patients with cancer responding to such therapy into germ-free mice increased anti-tumor effects of these drugs in the Darkoma inoculation model. In a second study, the authors investigated the oral and gut microbiome in patients with melanoma undergoing anti-PD-1 immunotherapy. They demonstrated that treatment response exhibited, treatment responders exhibited a higher microbial diversity and an increased amount of ruminococcus bacteria compared with non-responders. So these results are exciting as they point towards a key role of the gut microbiome in response to systemic cancer-related immunotherapies and are particularly notable as PD-1 immune cells accumulate also in damaged livers and promote liver carcinogenesis. So when considering the therapeutic strategy targeting microbiota, we may need to narrow down the specific microbiota from FMT cocktails to maybe a single strain or the metabolites, depending on the targeted disease. Following the successful outcome in cross-resumed infection, clinical trials of FMT for various liver diseases, as shown here, are ongoing. As mentioned, we may need to explore the more specific bacteria which contribute to the pathogenesis to achieve the substantial improvement in this field. So I will move to the second part. So primary sclerosing cholangitis PSC is an idiopathic chronic cholestatic liver disease characterized by the development of large bile duct structures and the destruction of biliary trees that lead to end-stage liver cirrhosis. To date, there remains no definitive medical treatment for this condition other than liver transplantation. A key characteristic of PSC is the association with UC-like colitis in approximately 30% of the cases in Japan and 60 to 80% in Western countries, suggesting a hypothesis that gut-derived molecules through a damaged intestinal barrier contribute to pathogenesis in the liver. So on the other hand, the majority of patients with UC are devoid of PSC. Furthermore, PSC-associated UC, PSC-UC shapes a distinct disease phenotype, such as 
right-sided information, rectal sparing, and also milder cases from classical UC, suggesting an additional layer of complexity beyond the intestinal information. Recent progress in the metagenomic analysis enabled us to identify the increase or decrease microbial species in liver disease, including PSC. So in PSC, including Pseudobacterium, Enterococcus, Lactobacillus, Veronella, Brotea, has been reported. However, it is still unclear whether these bacteria directly contribute to the pathogenesis or just represent a result of disease progression. So relationship between pathogenesis of PSC and ongoing studies aimed at elucidating disease mechanism and potential therapeutic targets as shown in the left. Importantly, the core process of PSC development remains obscure. However, efforts now delineating mechanism for bile duct injury and hepatobiliary information. The only approach fully relevant to human PSC is the human genetic association study. The genetic susceptibility to PSC aligned with prototypical autoimmune diseases as much as with IBD, but they only account for a fraction of the liability in PSC. So underscoring the role of other environmental factors, including the gut microbiota. Regarding the immune cell subsets that contribute to the pathogenesis of PSC, recent reports in hepatology have shown that the number of Th17 cells not Th1 cells increase, both in the liver and periphery of PSC patients. Furthermore, a frequent observation of bacteria detected by fish around the portal area, which may cause local Th17 priming, has been demonstrated. However, it's still uncertain whether the increased Th17 cell was pathogenic for the disease progression. As a clinical evidence of the pathogenic role of gut microbiota in PSC, recent clinical studies have shown that the short-term improvement of liver enzyme levels by oral antibiotics, such as metronidazole or vancomycin. However, it is still unclear whether the long-term prognosis could be improved by manipulating the composition of gut microbiota in PSC. And obviously, further study is required. So we hypothesize that specific gut microbiota contribute to the pathogenesis of PSC by inducing immune response in the liver via the gut liver axis. To clarify this, weaker samples from PSC patients and healthy controls were obtained with informed consent, and a metagenomic analysis of the gut microbiota composition was performed. In addition, to explain the direct effect of gut microbiota on the pathogenesis, we generated humanized microbiota mice by inoculation with human fecal samples to germ-free mice and analyzed immune response in the targeted organs. In the current study, uh, we used collection of fecal samples from 18 PSC patients comorbid U, como with comorbid UC 16 classic UC patients without PSC, and 10 healthy control. Obviously, serum hepatobiliary enzymes were higher in PSC. On the other hand, the disease activity in the colon tended to be higher in UC patients. This is a microbiome profile of human fecal samples. As shown in the left panel, the number of OTU was significantly decreased in PSC and UC compared to healthy controls. Furthermore, the microbiota of PSUC patients shown in orange and UC patients shown in purple demonstrate a distinct taxonomic trend from healthy control shown in green. However, difference between PSUC and classic UC was less evident, suggesting that the metagenomic analysis of the gut microbiota is not sufficient to discriminate PSC patients from UC in our cohort. So to generate humanized microbiota mice, fecal samples from healthy control PSUC patient and UC patient were orally inoculated into germ-free mice, 
followed by immunological assessment at day 28 post inoculation. As previously described, increase in IL-17 positive CD4 T cells, TH17 cells, was observed in the colon of mice inoculated with human samples, regardless of the presence of disease. Surprisingly, PSC, PSC UC mice exhibited a robust TH17 priming, not only in the colon, but also in the liver. As demonstrated here, three out of five lines of PSGC mice exhibited potent TH17 priming in the liver, whereas TH17 priming was not observed in any group of other notobiotic mice, suggesting that PSGUC patient derived microbiota directly induced the TH17 priming in the liver. Despite a robust TH17 priming in the liver, PSC-like cholangitis was not induced in the liver or PSUC mice, even by a long-term observation up to 19 days. Thus, we questioned whether PSC mice showed increased susceptibility to the experimental hepatobiliary injury by DDC feeding for 14 days. As shown here, DDC-fed PSUC mice showed increased TS17 response in the liver and higher susceptibility to DDC-induced hepatobiliary injury as compared with germ-free mice or heresy control mice. Pathological assessment shown in right revealed peridactyl fibrosis around the large bile duct in PSUC mice, a characteristic feature of PSC. So to identify the specific pathobionts responsible for bacterial translocation, livers, mesenteric lymph nodes, and spleens were removed from the notobiotic mice in a sterile manner. Of note, we isolated bacterial clones from the mesenteric lymph nodes, but not from livers or PSC mice, while no bacteria could be grown from any organs of other notobiotic mice. We finally identified these bacteria as Krebsia pneumonia, Proteus mirabilis, and Enterococcus gallinarum. Quantitative PCR analysis using human fecal samples revealed that 17 out of 18 PSC patients harbored KP, which was significantly higher than that of healthy control, non and UC patients as shown in the top panel. Similarly, the detection of Proteus mirabilis and Enterococcus gallinarum was also higher in PSC patients. Importantly, the prevalence of these three bacterial species, Krebsiera, Proteus, and Enterococcus in PSC patients was validated in another European PSC cohort. Again, all of the three bacteria was more prevalent in patients with PSC compared to healthy control and UC patient, suggesting more universal phenomenon in human PSC. To further determine which bacterial species is responsible for TH17 priming, we inoculated germ-free mice with three bacterial strains, either in individually or in combination. Consistent with the result of PSUC mice, three mixed notobiotic mice showed strong TH17 response, both in the colon and in the liver. The monocolonization of KP, but not dual colonization of Proteus mirabilis and Enterococcus gallinarum induced a moderate TH17 response in the liver, suggesting that KP is indispensable in TH17 induction in the liver. We next performed fish to visualize bacteria shown in LET in colonic mucosa of the notobiotic mice. While no bacterium could invade the colonic epithelial cell by mucin layers in SPF mice, Bacterial DNA could be detected underneath the intestinal epithelium in single KP notobiotic mice and also three mixed notobiotic mice, but not in PM plus EG notobiotic mice, highlighting the essential role of KP in the bacterial invasion to chronic epithelial cells. To, to clarify the mechanism of how microbiota interact with intestinal epithelial cells, 
we used the monolayered human clonic organoids co-culture system that allowed the apical side to interact with the bacteria. Technically, it is very difficult to inject the microbiota inside of 3D organoids. Thus, we generated 2D organoids for this purpose. Interestingly, as shown below, Klebsia pneumonia derived from PSG patient induced epithelial pores formation in the monolayer within eight hours, as observed in the co-culture with E. coli 0157 strains. Importantly, this performing capacity was not common to Klebsia pneumonia, since a commercially available KP strain did not induce the pore formation. Immunostating illustrated that epithelial pores were filled with cleaved caspiatory apoptotic cells shown in green and encircled by variable epithelial cells. Furthermore, RNA-seq analysis confirmed these findings with marked upregulation of genes related to apoptosis and inflammatory pathways in performing KP-stimulated epithelial cells compared to non-performing KP-stimulated epithelial cells. Epithelial performing capacity of KP varied among the strains, of which seven strains induced for formation, while four did not. The comparative analysis of the whole genome sequencing of poor forming and non poor forming strains listed 97 or sorghum genes associated with epithelial poor forming capacity, including genes involved in type 6 secretion system and reactive activate oxygen species. Type 6 secretion system is a molecular machine used by a wide range of gram-negative bacteria species to transport proteins across the cellular envelope into an adjacent targeted cells. These results suggested that epithelial performing capacity of Klebsia pneumonia is determined by strain-specific genotype and also further studies now ongoing to clarify the precise mechanism. To determine whether the in vitro epithelial performing capacity correlates to the in vivo barrier disruption, we performed FITC dextran leakage analysis in mice inoculated with a single epithelial performing KP strain, 4 kilo Dalton FIT dextran, but not 70 kilo Dalton FITC dextran leaked to the systemic circulation indicating the presence of barrier disruption that allows the penetration of small particles into the mucosa. Of note, the increased leakage was not detected in mice inoculated with a non-performing Klebsia pneumonia strain, JCM 1662, suggesting that FTR performing capacity contributes to the in vivo barrier disruption. Furthermore, to examine whether the performing ability of KP contributed to in vivo barrier disruption and also liver inflammation. We generated notobiotic with modified stream strains where performing KP was replaced with the non-performing strain. In contrast to stream mix notobiotic mass, modified stream mix notobiotic mice were devoid of mucosal barrier invasion and showed lower serum and toxin level. Furthermore, Modified slimix notobiotic mice exhibited considerably lower levels of liver TH17 cells, suggesting that the epithelial demanding effect of KP is crucial for the induction of liver TH17 response. To address whether the liver TH17 response contribute to the disease progression, we utilized lower gamma T inverse agonists that selectively inhibit TH17 differentiation in DDC fed slimix notobiotic mice model. As expected, treatment by roll gamma T inverse agonists reduced the number of TH17 cells without affecting TH1 cells in the liver, confirming the specific inhibition of TH17 cell differentiation by roll gamma T inverse agonists. Importantly, treating, treatment with roll gamma T inverse agonists improved hepatobiliary injury and fibrosis of DDC fat stream mix notobiotic mice, both in histology and serology, 
supporting the pathogenic, pathogenic lore of microbiota-mediated TS17 activation in this model. So finally, uh, to determine whether antibiotic treatment could modulate liver immune response in our experimental model. We generated notobiotic mice using fecal samples from another PhD patient who harbored KP and AG and treated the mice with vancomycin or metronidazole. So we confirmed that vancomycin and metronidazole treatment demonstrated the antibi ant antibacterial activity against EG and KP, respectively. Notably, the TH17 response <coughs> induced in PSCUC notobiotic mice was significantly decreased by vancomycin or metronidazole treatment both in the liver and in the colon. Supporting a lower of specific pathobionts in TH17 induction in the liver. So in summary, uh, the current study identified disease modulating pathobionts from PSCUC patient. One of the key functions of these pathobionts is to disrupt intestinal barrier through epithelial damaging effect of KP which enables collateral translocation of other pathobionts and elicits TH17 priming in the liver. Our results collectively provide evidence for specific pathobionts as triggers for PSC. For the studies are required to examine whether these pathobionts serve as therapeutic target for PSC in the future. So I'd like to thank all of my collaborators and also I'd like to thank the patient and healthy control who participated in this study. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very, very interesting uh, presentation and overview in general and, uh, and very nice and interesting data. Okay, Shinji. Thank you for your good presentation. I'm so surprised. And uh, I have uh, <clears throat> several questions. <clears throat> that the, the first is um, in P PSG patients, uh, how about their machine layer? Uh, in your mouse model, you uh, treated the DDS like that to remove machine. Ah, no, we used. Uh, DDC. 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 It's uh, uh, to induce yeah, experimental um, hepatic injury, not maybe, to DSS. Maybe mechanical barrier is important for the treatment. But uh, in case of PSG patients, do your Krebsian pneumonia enter the uh, lumen directory? Or are there any much in there? No? I think the mucin layer is still there. And, but if we see uh, the pathology of the colon in mice inoculated with PSC, that seems almost normal. So no, no, uh, pathology, uh, no uh, inflammation in the colon. So I think only the barrier was disrupted in this, mo in, in this mice. So that enables other pathobionts uh, to translocate to the mesenteric lymph nodes and induce TH17 cells. It might be the trigger for uh, liver inflammation. And in case of uh, uh, SBP, uh, we usually uh, get a bacteria Krebs pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And is, is there any differences between this Krebs pneumonia and the PSC Krebs pneumonia? Um, you know, that's, that's a great think? question, but uh, we don't know if the Krebs pneumonia derived from SVP patients has performing ability or not. We need to check that later. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, Marshall. Uh, thank you for your uh, excellent uh, lecture. So uh, in our study, we found the Krebsler and the Vinilola mm -hmm. all increased in both PVC 
and uh, AIH patients. Mm -hmm. So other study uh, showed that maybe Krebsler also increased in PSC. So what's the disease specific of uh, uh, bacteria? Yeah, thank you for a great question. Um, we also checked the status of KP uh, in PBC and AIH patients. The prevalence was lower than PSC, but they still have that. So I suggest that this phenomenon may not be specific to PSC, but also to the more universal uh, autoimmune liver diseases. Maybe uh, they cause the innate immunity mm -hmm. and then uh, preposition right. mm -hmm. uh, for the autoimmunity. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? If not, I have a maybe a naive question. It, do you see in the future the possibility to modulate specific uh, strength or, or, or bacteria with uh, some uh, not general antibiotics like vancomycin or? Yes, uh, that's a great point. Uh, we are now considering. Uh, more specificity uh, with as a target. So such as bacterial fridge or something, they, can, they may uh, kill the specific strain of KP, but it may be long street. <laughs> no. Okay, thank you. So if no other question or comment, thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.